Uh, 11 nights away from WrestleMania. As of last night, Monday Night Raw 3 2023, we were 12 nights away from Mania. And the epic showdown between the American Nightmare and the Tribal Chief, Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns. That was the big selling point of last night. Did Cody and Roman live up to the hype? Let's just say that when their segment was through last night, when the show went off the air, even the most jaded of fans to this main event at Mania, even the most jaded of fan was sold by this one epic face-to-face encounter, this one immaculate promo where they dug deep and took it to the next level, which we can all agree the match we know is going to be good at Mania. We know the story is sitting in their lap, but we all, for the most part, felt like there was just one thing missing. We couldn't put our finger on it, but there was one layer to the story that needed to captivate us to put us over the top, right? One more layer to fully intrigue us. And last night, wham, we got it. Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns sold the pro wrestling world with just one promo. We're going to talk all about it coming up in this Raw review for 320. We're also going to talk Kana Asuka delivering to the world finally Showing the world her mission statement for WrestleMania. I am not here, nor will I be coexisting with my WrestleMania opponent. My mission statement is simple. I'm done being the side chick to my opponent, and I'm coming to take the title. This is not the same little side chick Asuka. This is Kana Asuka. And her mission statement was heard, felt loud and clear by Bianca Belair last night, by Asuka's actions. We'll talk all about it coming up in this review. Also, for the second time in three weeks, Seth Rollins got knocked the fuck out by Logan Paul. And I mean, wabaka, flat out, lights are on, but nobody's home. Seth Rollins was done, did dirty. By Logan Paul, man. And Logan Paul cut an eight-minute promo. We got to talk about this story, this feud, that really heated up last night. And on top of that, we also got to talk some of the bad, right? Like Rhea Ripley and and Bailey. Why? Why is Rhea Ripley and Bailey in a match? Two heels that have no... Guys, we have to talk about it. <laughs> We're going to talk about main event Jey Uso too. Roman Reigns in his personal locker room told everybody to leave. Wise man, get everybody out. Jey, you stay. And the storyline in our number one between Jey and Roman. Fucking goosebumps, bro. That is professional wrestling. And WWE right now is just all cylinders all systems go right now for sto- a lot of people say, well, it's Sammy and Bloodline. That's really the only story, basically. After that, there's nothing. Are you kidding me? The Bloodline alone has like three separate stories going. There's the Bloodline in Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. There's the internal Bloodline story with Jey Uso and Roman. Then there's Roman and Cody Rhodes, which was taken to the next level last night. And that's not even counting other stories like the father-son story that keeps building with Ray and Dominic Mysterio. Or after last night, finally upping the ante with Bianca Belair and Kana Asuka. There's a lot going on right now. Would BC love another month before Mania to build this even more and more properly? Absolutely. Beggars can't be choosers, man. We're rocking right now with a lot of storylines. And even if you're not fully behind some of these stories... At least it's something we haven't had the better part of 10 years. We have hope, optimism. There's a glimmer of hope. There's a pulse. There's stories developing. And some of them are really kicking in to high gear. We got to talk all about it, guys. I have a full review of Monday Night Raw. Amplify thoughts and facts being dropped. We're also going to talk Bray Wyatt. No mention of this dude. No mention of Bobby Lashley. There's so much to go over. I'm going to down some more coffee. We're going to come back 
and talk all about it, starting from minute one, hour one, all the way to the main event seg with Cody and Roman. On your way in, you know the routine, man. Smash that up. I don't care if you DDT the son of a bitch. I don't care if you give it a pedigree, a Batista bomb, a sharpshooter, a Canadian destroyer, a buckshot lariat. Whatever your move, or give it the old million dollar dream sleeper hole, but smash that like it helps out the algorithm don't forget to join the channel earn your membership earn your gold card guys and make sure you keep it activated 24 7 um but swig a few a few few swigs right Uh, of some duncan extra extra coffee we come right back we smash this review out amplified salud Now, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn start this show, and I love how they had the camera follow Owens through the curtain. Very cool. You see that too far and few in between, you know, when the guy's coming out or the gal is coming out through the entranceway. I don't know if they've ever done it with the, with the uh, ladies, have they? But the camera follows the wrestler out from, from behind them, so you see the crowd's reaction. You see a different angle a different point of view a different aspect man and it's so cool because it's the start of the show so the fans are one of the most exciting times that they're going to have during the night the start of the show it's kevin owens they admire the dude they're excited to see him and it was so cool owens looks left owens looks right the camera is panning and it was just a cool vibe to start the show right different right sometimes it's the little things especially from the jump that make you go all right that's cool You know, if the the remote is not totally uh, out of your hand at that point, if you're not sold for the next three hours to be on the USA Network, maybe your hand at least got a little bit lowered, right? Right? Something a little like that, man. Switch it up a little bit. Have a little bit of fun. Move the cameraman. Let's get a different aspect, a different feel. I love that. And then when Sami Zayn came out, man, what a pop, dude. (laughs) It went another another level of loudness in that arena in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, that was followed by a huge, a massive Sammy chant. Sammy, Sammy. And KO says, I, I think they love you, dude. <laughs> That's what, what he say exactly. Uh, but he says, uh, you know, I think they like you, is what he said. That was a quote. And then so <laughs> once he says, I think they like you to Sammy, the crowd then switches the chant up. And starts a KO, KO chant. So then Sammy says, you know, I think they like you too, pal. And then Owens has some fun with it. He says, yeah, I see what they did there. I said they liked you, so then they then they showed like love to me. <laughs> it was just a fun moment between Zayn and Owens, man. Uh, of course, best friends in real life. And, and it's cool to see them have that moment before they got down the business. And they did get down to business, man, right after. Uh, They went on a several-minute rant on their disdain for the bloodline. And it ended, the promo ended when Sami Zayn says, "Um, Well, Kev, this is a quote from Sami Zayn. Well, Kev, there's only one thing left to do. And they both look up at the WrestleMania sign. Of course, we know what they're alluding to. The big tag title match at WrestleMania. Now, this brings out the Usos. Usos hit ringside. Jimmy is against the idea of a tag title match at Mania. Jimmy is saying, you've you've been together all of, what, three minutes? We've been together our entire lives. Now, BC, just like the Usos, we know that's not true. Again, Owens, Zayn, real-life best friends. Uh, They've been together for weddings, children being born, traveled the world together, and they've actually been a tag team many, many times in the past. Uh, Not just WWE, but elsewhere around the world. El Generico! (laughs) Um, So, and Kevin Steen, right? So, uh, under different names, all that, man. They've, in many ways, they've been a tag team for years, you could say. And trust me, BC is not a big fan of taking wrestler A and wrestler B and throwing them together and saying they're a tag team just because you don't have anything creatively for them individually. I can't stand that. But every once in a while, it just works, 
right? I remember Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase and IRS, um, the father of Bray Wyatt, Wyndham Redunda. And that just worked, right? Because they believed in their shit. They believed in their shtick. And they fully invested. And when you do that, we, the fans, can now care about it at another level. Right? It makes sense. Million Dollar Man is this million dollar man. What does a millionaire need more than anything? Or at least at the top of the list? A good tax agent, right? (laughs) A millionaire is trying to save as much money as he can. Not owe the government. And build his empire. You start that with a good tax agent. So it made sense, right? There's IRS and Million Dollar Man. They threw them together. They formed the tag team known as uh, Money Incorporated. And it worked. It's like Earthquake and Typhoon coming together. And it works. Now, of course, PC can think of a million tag teams that they threw together uh, over the past several decades. And it failed miserably for many reasons. So I am against taking wrestler A and B, throwing them together, making it a tag team because you don't have anything for them. But in this case, I am absolutely down for Owens and Zayn because to BC and so many others, and you could probably, Zayn and Owens would probably say the same thing. They've been a tag team for years anyway. So when Jimmy said, "Eh, you've all been together, what, three minutes, we've been together our entire lives. Sure, it might not be every day and night for their entire existence like the Usos, Jimmy and Jay. But damn, if there was ever a team that knows each other inside and out and has been together for so many years, it's Sami Zayn and Owens. And that's what sells this match to so many people. Because we know behind the scenes, that's the real deal. So to play it out in front of the curtain... With the spotlight on him in that ring, man, that brings it to another level and layer of care. So I understand where Jimmy was going, but you knew, like, not so fast, man. You could say that about most people, not Sammy and Owens. Anyway, Jimmy is against the idea because he just doesn't feel they've earned it, doesn't feel they're a legit tag team, and just doesn't want to put the titles on the line against them. However, Jay says, hold up, hold up, Jimmy, hold up. This may be our opportunity to finally put this KO Zane problem in the dirt once and for all. So they actually end up accepting the WrestleMania challenge for the championships, man. Um, they think that Roman Reigns, the tribal chief, would, would want them to stand up for the bloodline and finally take care of them. If it's got to be at WrestleMania, then that's the deal. So Jimmy was against it. Jay wanted to put this thing to bed once and for all. Uh, Once they accept the the challenge, the four just start to brawl, man. Pretty badass brawl, a little bit inside the ring, a little bit outside. Uh, Usos end up trying to be fucking restrained. Zayn and Owens are in the ring saying, come on, let's go. You can't get by fucking four referees. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of friction there, a lot of tension. Crowd is really into it. And then up on the Tron, um, a black SUV pulls up in the parking lot. And we see these shiny titles through the windshield. Of course, you know that's Paul Heyman and those two championships, the WWE Universal Championships. And sure enough, Solo Sokoa gets out, Paul Heyman and Roman Reigns all exit the vehicle up on the Tron uh, from the parking lot. The crowd pops big, I'm talking huge, when they see Roman Reigns come out of that SUV. It took BC back to the Attitude Era, guys. Back in the Attitude Era, you would have something really fun, especially at the start of the show most of the time, something really fun, a good segment and they wouldn't just rest on it, right? You could easily just rest on it. Hey, we, we got the crowd right where, where we want them. We told the story beautifully. And let's just go to commercial. No, back in the day in the Attitude Era, you would add layers and levels to it. So you already have a lot of fun with Owens, Zayn, and the Usos, right? Crowds into it. It was a pretty good setup to the brawl. A pretty good brawl. And we have the title match confirmed. But on top of that, Last night, WWE didn't decide to just rest on that and go to commercial. They had the the Tron. They have the SUV pulling up in the parking lot. 
The fucking bloodline exits the vehicle. Roman Reigns is there and everybody is staring up like, oh, fuck. Business just picked up, as Jim Ross would say. It was another lair. They didn't have to necessarily do that. They could have went to break, came back, park, uh, fucking parking lot shot. Here comes the SUV. No, they put it all into Q1 as we faded into our first commercial. That is badass, man. That's television. That's entertainment. You set up so much, so beautifully, and then you added the extra layer. So now the crowd is like, it was like attitude error where you're looking everywhere, right? You're looking in the ring. You got Zayn and Owens fired up. You're looking to the aisle way, man. Referees and suits and ties are trying to back up the Usos. Usos just realize what happened on the Tron. The fans are also looking up at the Tron where the bloodline is now exiting the vehicle. They just got to the arena. If you're in the arena, your attention's everywhere, right? And now we're fading to commercial if you're an audience at home. You got to fuck the remote's down now. You Now you have to see what happens with the bloodline. What happens with Roman? Is he happy with what just happened to the Usos or not? And by the way, we'll find out. The next time you see the bloodline in Roman's personal locker room, at first he's not happy with him. He says, you guys okay? It looked like you got pretty beat up out there. He wasn't happy with him. That's what I mean, right? You start questioning. Uh-oh, did Roman, does Roman know what just happened? Um, that was just, uh, let me be, let me see, sum it up, right? The, the last 10 minutes of reviewing Q1, segment one last night. Let me sum it up with a cherry on top. This was a good segment. This is what I mean by good. Great, mm, I are the beholder, right? But good for sure. If you know how to critique pro wrestling properly, like actually check off every box, if you are a real critic, not just a fan who watches and has 140 characters and you give your opinions on wrestling and you call yourself a critic, (laughs) but if you really know how to dissect professional wrestling, this is how you start the show. Could it be even better? Of course, but... If you watch Monday Night Raw the past 10 years, you know it could have been really bad. This was damn good. Very good first segment. And good, one of the biggest reasons why it was a good first segment is not just what it did for Q1, but what it did for the rest of the night. Q2 all the way to Q12. Seg 2 to Seg 12, man. What it did for the rest of the night because they kept going back to the bloodline. And it was fucking just beautifully done. In fact, a lot more bloodline in hour number one. We'll get to that in a second. But when we came back from break, we were going into our first matchup of the night. A-Town down. Austin Theory versus Montez Ford. Ah! Now, as far as Theory and Ford, they let these boys go out. And go about a good 14 minutes, man. This was a 14-minute bout. I think it was just under 14 minutes, maybe. Uh, showcased Ford nicely, setting him up for a future singles run. And clearly, as I've said for the longest, Dawkins is kind of the anchor. Unfortunately, we hope the best for Dawkins. And when they do split up, we hope that in a sink or swim situation, we absolutely hope that Dawkins can swim to shore. We hope he doesn't sink. We hope he's not just the anchor to Montez, um, or we hope that he is just the anchor to Montez and not the anchor to himself as well, right? We don't want him to just sink. We're hoping Dawkins does okay, but we all know what has to happen. Montez is a star that is already shining. It's no longer a a, a case of, oh, in the future, man, Montez's star is going to shine so bright. No, now it's already shining. So staying in this tag team where clearly WWE doesn't know what to do with the Street Profits. And at this point, they've been hurt so badly as a team that I don't know if people are ever going to truly invest in them. So what's happening is you have this star that is shining, but the light is being dimmed by WWE's booking. Why dim? Why shade such a shining star? Montez's time is now. Reminds me about John Cena's theme. My time is now. (laughs) Uh, But Montez's time is now, man. And once again, he shows you this, man. Uh, Well over 10 minutes, uh, just under 14 with Austin Theory. A very nice showing for and by Montez. 
Um, the finish, clearly, Theory had to win this match. He's going to WrestleMania to take on one of the legends in this business, whether you're a big fan or not. BC's not a huge fan of Cena, but I totally understand what he has given to the company and to the world and what he means to pro wrestling. So absolutely, even though I'm not the biggest John Cena fan, I totally understand that he is a legend in this industry. Um, and, and when you're going to take on this legend at WrestleMania, you cannot lose 12 nights away from Mania, which is where we were last night, 12 nights. So Theory was going to win this match, no question. We understand this. And he did. He delivered uh, his A-Town down for the W. But again, a very good showing for Montez. I don't think he loses too much at all from here. Um, maybe post-WrestleMania is where he finally gets a little bit of that rocket. We'll see. Or after WrestleMania, he's still dancing around with the Profits, right? Possibly. He's probably going to be in that weird uh, eight-man tag match at WrestleMania. They're, they're acting like this is a big deal. <laughs> uh, the tag team showcase is what they're calling it at WrestleMania. I'm like, this is just any Raw and SmackDown eight-man tag match. This is why I always tell you guys, these nonsensical matches for... For Raw and SmackDown, when they just put all like like four teams in there for an eight-man tag. This is why I say you can't do that that often. Because there's going to come a time, maybe even at a pay-per-view, where you need to have a match like that. And we've already been desensitized to it, right? We've already seen it so many times that now it's at WrestleMania and we're supposed to care about an eight-man tag match. Same for the ladies. How many times have we seen a bunch of lady tag teams out there just because they don't have anything for them individually? So they just throw everybody out there, man. Have a battle royal. Have a fatal four-way. Have an eight-woman tag match. Have a ten-woman tag match. I mean, how many times? So now we're getting an eight-woman tag and an eight-man tag, and, and, and they're trying to act like it's a showcase. They're, they're qualifying to get into these matches, some of these teams. It's a... Uh, it, it's bonkers, man. Uh, now, we think that's totally replacing the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, though. So, uh, I don't know. It's one of those uh, pick-your-poison type deals, right? But that's what it looks like Montez is going to be in for WrestleMania. Anyway, Austin Theory wins this A-Town down. Post-match, Theory delivers his best promo on the roster to date, man. This was Austin Theory's best promo of his career, and it was only three lines, guys. <laughs> sometimes more simple. Simple is sometimes more, right? Less is definitely more sometimes. This was three lines. He didn't believe in me. John Cena, you don't believe in me. But at WrestleMania, you will. He drops the mic. And guys, there was conviction. There was amplification in his voice. I never heard that tone from Austin Theory. So that was really cool to see. You can claim there was a reset several months ago after the Money in the Bank debacle. The tragedy that was the Money in the Bank failed uh, cash-in. Oh, I don't want to relive that, and I know none of you guys do. But you can claim that there was a reset, but that's not a true reset, guys. It's not. Um, all he did was he put down the cell phone. Um, instead of the green or yellow jacket, he put on a black one. It's still the same egotistical character. It's still somebody who gives cheap shots and runs away when they, the, the situation is not uh, to, to his liking, right? Typical heel, by the way, which is good. But it's the same Austin Theory from before, guys. Same thing. <laughs> Slight tweaks is not a reset. But when you start to literally change your tone and your demeanor and who you actually are, starts from within, that's a reset. Now, I'm not saying he's fully reset yet, but what I heard and saw from that three-line promo, that's more of the Austin theory we should be getting, man. If you truly want to reset and press that reset button, a little less of the egotistical shit, a little bit more on the uh, severely serious side, right? Let's really see Austin theory go to the next level, not just claim he's the next level. There you go. So I, I like that, man. Three simple lines. Great conviction. Great amplification. Best promo of Theory's main roster career easily. Three simple lines. Short and sweet. Now he's ready to compete with Jonathan Cena at WrestleMania. 
We then go into a powerful backstage segment, man. Powerful backstage seg with all of the bloodline seated in Roman's personal locker room. Roman tells the wise man that he wants everyone to clear the room. Everybody gets up. They're about to leave, but he tells Jay Uso to stay. Jay takes a seat. Almost reluctantly, almost like a, a kid who not just principal's office, but like he's about to get scolded by his father, you know, and then the dad doesn't even have to say a word. The kid knows that he's disappointed or there's something wrong. So there's this awkward silence in the air, this great tension and friction unspoken. So Jay takes a seat next to Roman. Complete silence between the two takes us to break and i'm talking like they just sat on this for like 15 seconds 20 seconds just silence as jay looks at roman but roman is staring at the ground like he's either about to be scolded or he's about to ask a question and he better get the right answer jay staring at roman like why am i being summoned why everybody else got to leave and roman staring at the ground we fade into a commercial break fading to black fuck bro come on great television man storytelling that we have been deprived of for 10 years in this company and it, it's not stopping with just Sami Zayn. And Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns and Jey Uso is just next level, man. Them two alone. Much love to Jimmy. Jimmy is a big role in all this. Everybody. The whole bloodline is. I can speak. But Jey Uso? I mean, they call him Main Event Jey. I mean, if ever there was an, a time where that meant so much, it's right now. I mean, he is living up to that moniker, main event. Jay. You could put him in a main event right now and I, I sold, absolutely sold. You got me on that. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I will, uh, I'd be front row. You know what I mean? If, if they're in the city, I'd be front row to watch that thing. Jay Uso versus Roman Reigns, if they ever wanted to do that. But you remember when Roman first went heel and it started with that family feud, he was in that little thing with Jimmy and Jay actually. And separately, they were fucking main eventers. Jay Uso was a main eventer already, man. And they would just run it back. But this segment was so incredible, man. Jay and Roman, utter silence as Roman told Jay to stay behind. Like, we're going to have a talk. And when we came back from break, this is the best part too. When we came back, we didn't go to like the ring for a match. They sat on this, bro. Come on, how special. This is what I've been saying for the five plus years that I've had this channel. You know, you had the television shows are for storylines. Of course, you get some wrestling. Some matches will, will be lengthy as well, 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, okay. So we, we can have a couple of good matches, right? Uh, in several matches on the card, obviously, some will be shorter. But the television show, especially when you have three hours every Monday, that should be for storytelling. Tell your stories, set up your feuds, set up your matches for your next pay-per-view. Set up your pay-per-view. And then at the pay-per-view is when you have all your clangers, right? You put out all all the stops in the matches, man. You make the matches so epic, we're going to remember them. But it's the stories that go into it. And that has to be set up in the shows, And I feel in 2023, we're just putting a bunch of matches out there left and right, and and it's easy for the companies, right? They don't have to spend any time. It's lazy, it's lackluster, but it's simple. We don't have to, we don't have to work too hard, right? We're just going to put a bunch of matches out there. The fans will yell all their chants. This is awesome. Fight forever. Holy shit. They'll do all the chants. And then we'll take a commercial break. We'll come back. We'll do another match, right? Maybe some idiot on fucking line will give five, six, ten stars to the match. Who knows? Right? And we'll re- repeat the process every show, every week, every pay-per-view. No, man. Last night, something was different. They sat on the story. And they've been doing this for several months, really. They've done this a lot with the Bloodline story. And Rey Mysterio and Dominic has gotten a lot of time to their story, too. Even a lot of segments that are just on WWE.com that should be on the television shows. 
but we're paying attention to stories a lot more. And they, they came back from break after Roman said, tell Jay to stay behind. They come back from break, no match. They stay backstage in Roman's personal locker room. So we came back from break right to the same story. I, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, bro, give me 45 straight minutes of this shit. It's a three hour raw. We all say the third hour should be cut anyway. I'm good with the whole fucking hour just being storytelling. I don't even got to go back to the ring. You can go to the ring for hour number two. Spend the rest of hour number one just in this story, and I'm set. This is television. This is pro wrestling. These are the characters that need to be defined, and reasons need to be given as to why we should put these characters on a pedestal. And it's storytelling 101, like what we saw last night. So we come back from break, and Roman is looking now at Jay, finally. And Roman is grilling Jay, questioning his loyalty. He says, are you family? Are you bloodline? Are you with us? I need to know. Jay takes a few beats right before he answers. Build that suspension. That's what I mean. Jay has just been next fucking top tier level uh, as of late. And by as of late, I mean for a few years now, Jay's on top of his game. He gives a few beats and he says... I'm bloodline. Oos, I'm with you. Roman says, I hope so. That's what I needed to hear. And we go back to silence as Jay now is looking up. Somebody is now in the room after Roman told everybody to leave. Somebody just entered frame. Jay keeps looking at him and Roman says, you can leave now. Jay kind of leaves hesitantly. Enter frame. Paul E. Dangerously. Paul Heyman enters frame he gets on his knees basically and he's looking right into Roman's fucking eyes as only Paul Heyman can do Roman's just looking straight ahead or at the ground he's not looking at Paul Paul's looking at Roman and with great hesitance in his voice with with, with his voice trembling Paul Heyman says my tribal chief did you get the the answers you were looking for and Roman says after a few beats yes I did, wise man. And wise man and Roman kind of stare at... Well, Paul is staring still at Roman. Roman is still staring at the ground. And we sat on that. Yes, I did, wise man. And we sat on that for like 10 seconds before we faded out. Bro, I, I goosebumps talking about it. how magical when you just take the time with the right individuals to tell the story properly. That is professional wrestling. You can have all the clangers and bangers that you want. You can have all of the starred matches you want. Give them 10, 20 stars. BC will never remember that shit. It will never resonate past the moments we saw the match. I'll never go back. I'll never watch it again. I'll never think about it again. Wrestling is not just about cool sequences and moves upon moves upon no selling upon no selling. Flips and dives. Whatever people think wrestling became in 2023, it is nowhere near that. It will never survive if it becomes just that. It needs stories. It needs larger than life characters. And that's what WWE is starting to do. Whether you love this company or you claim that you don't love it or don't like it or you claim you don't watch it or you don't watch it and you just watch YouTube clips or if you if you listen to a BC and, and, and I say it was pretty good, then you give it a chance. Thank you. I appreciate that, by the way. Trusting in my words and my review. I know there's a lot of you guys. You don't watch the show because Vince McMahon has burned you for so many years. So you say, BC, I just listen to you, man. And if you say something was good, I check it out. So I appreciate that. I'm telling you, this storyline within the whole first hour was immaculate. Immaculate. Um, And and they're just telling this story so properly, so beautifully. And it's not just the booking of it or the creative direction. Of course, Paul Heyman is probably head of the heap with the creativity in this thing. But it's the execution of the actual talent. And everybody involved has been playing their roles to the next degree and next level of amplification. I could not be more proud of all these dudes. And we just spent so much time at the end of hour one with that storyline in Roman's personal locker room. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Can you tell that I really loved it? (laughs) 
And then we ended our number one uh, with Omas squashing Mustafa Ali in like 37 seconds. Literally about 37 seconds, man. That's the build to Omas and Lesnar for WrestleMania. That's the build. You guys excited to see Omas and Lesnar still? I know when I ask that question, there's always people that go, I am basically, I think it's going to be fun. I, I hope, I hope you're right. Because the build, there is none. There is no build at all. In fact, it was funny because they bragged about last week when Omas shoved Brock Lesnar over the top rope by just his his hand. And you remember, there was a little botch there. Brock likes to fly over the uh, the top rope for our entertainment. Brock doesn't have to do that, but he just, he knows no other speed. So I gave him a mulligan. Everybody else made, made it a, a big botch. I didn't feel it was a big deal. Brock doesn't really do that that often. He just wanted to fly over and Omas was trying to take him back over. But yes, it was a botch. And it was funny. They bragged about how it had 10 million views. Well, that's because of the botch, right? Word got out because the wrestling world made it such a big deal that there was a big Lesnar botch, Omas botch, the way that they did it, right? Um, it, it, so that's why it got more attention, obviously. Like people want to see, I mean, these are two beasts, monsters, right? Omas and Brock, and they had a big botch. This is what everybody was told. So that's why I got so many views, obviously. So they showed the clip, and guys, they edited the actual botch out. Now you say, well, BC, obviously, they don't want to show that. I understand. But you bragged about it like, like you got 10 million views across social media platforms because everybody just needed to see Omos and Brock. Bro, it's because of the botch. And then they just edited it, and it was a pristine edit. WWE has the best editing team. It looked like that's what really happened, right? They showed the in-ring where he was going, uh, just going over, and then they clipped it outside to where Lesnar actually went over the top rope. It was beautifully, masterfully edited. But it's just hilarious how <laughs> they bragged about it under false pretenses of how they got the 10 million views, and then they edited the shit out of it. It was just, I don't know, BC got a, I, did anybody else catch that? Or was I, I can't be the only one that caught that. Completely edited that out. And I understand, but maybe don't even mention it. I don't know. Just show the clip, show what happened last week. Too funny, man. I'm telling you, if, if Vince is still fully in charge, he's going to see what works on social, right? What gets 10 million views? He's going to be like, more botches. <laughs> Triple H and everybody's like, do you know what a botch is, Vince? I don't think you want that many, man. It's going to make us look like it. No, more botches. I want botches. Somebody get Nia Jax back here. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding around. We're playing. Come on now. And that ended our number one, guys. A pretty damn good first hour, though. The start of the show, Zane Owens, the Usos, the SUV pulls up into the parking lot. Roman Reigns is in the building. We fade to black to our first commercial. That whole Q1 was just so, so good. A pretty good match with Austin Theory and Montez Ford. And then for the rest of the hour, for the most part, we stayed with the Bloodline storyline. And they just sat on that. We had one real match in hour one. If you take out the 37 squash of Ali. At this point, just give the guy his release. The poor guy doesn't even know what he's doing anymore. I think he reset his character. Tried to reset his character again to Mr. Positivity Ali or something. He's playing this weird ca character. I, I don't even know. It's, it's like a bootleg Seth Rollins. And I'm not I'm trying not to throw shade. But I mean, you're confusing this guy as to what he even is. Just give the guy his release. But if you take away the Omos squash match of Ali, you only had one real match, and BC is totally fine with that. Totally fine. Um, because the storylines took precedent, right? This was story heavy. What we've been asking for for years, and our number one delivered masterfully. And if you're one of those people that just can't stand WWE, this is not a good time period for you because they're hitting, they're cracking home runs out of the park with storylines. And people are like, but it's just the bloodline in Sami Zayn. It's, it, that's it. Once they lose that, it's over. Guys, bullshit. Bloodline is involved in a really good storyline with Kevin Owens as well right now. Bloodline is in a really good story within one another, especially Jay and Roman. And after, when this show is off the air, we're going to go over hour three in a little bit. Bloodline now, Roman is in a really good story with Cody Rhodes. 
So, uh, and not just that, even if you take away the bloodline, man, Rey Mysterio and Dominic are in a really good story right now. And whether you like Bray Wyatt or not, he was in something really good with L.A. Knight. <laughs> of course, it went into a Mountain Dew match, but the lead up was fucking good. We'll talk about Bray Wyatt in a little bit as well Um, in his absence. In fact, if you want, we could do that right now before hour number two. But my point is, for a lot of fans, man, there's stories right there, right? Asuka and fucking Bianca Belair finally heated up last night, right? Finally, we're done with this can they coexist bullshit. And I love Kana, Asuka, and Bianca Belair right now. Can the story be better? No question. But it's sitting in their lap of why Asuka's so pissed off and why this means so much to her. And why she's not just going to sit around and coexist with Belair. And after last night, she showed you that. So there's stories right now. Would I like another month before Mania so we could tell them even more properly? No question. Some weeks, I think they are phoning it in. But there's several really good things happening in WWE. So if you're just a WWE hater, this is not a good time period for you. Uh, I totally understand that, man. Especially the bloodline. Because there's so many stories within that one group. Now, before I go into hour number two, which is going to be Logan Paul's Impulsive Live starting hour two, um, I, I want to talk about Bray Wyatt real quick, man. He was not a part of the show again last night. Not even a mention. No mention of Bobby Lashley. So at this point, I think it's clear to say we have to scrap the match. I, I don't know what you're going to do with one week left. As it stands right now, you're 11 nights away. If you don't do something like massive on Friday night, and even then you're only going to be eight nights away from Mania. Mania weekend is one one week later from Friday night SmackDown. So... There's nothing you can do right now is what I'm saying. You're going to be left with one Monday Night Raw. Next week is the go-home show to Mania. And you did not tell a story with Bobby and Bray. You waited too late, and you didn't tell anything from the jump. All I remember from them is the Muscle Man dance. That's it. And I love Bray Wyatt. This is a pro-Bray channel. And I always will rock with this dude. But... Not only did we not have a lot of answers to so many questions that Bray had given us in his creativity, his genius, right? And I love it. But even I said, we have to start answering some of these questions. Well, now we just have even more questions. And it's not even on screen. It's kind of behind the scenes. Like, what the fuck's the deal with Bray? Is he okay? What ailment is he dealing with? Uh, Like, they're not saying shit. And I understand if it's like a an illness or something, right? It doesn't help the character if Michael Cole or Kevin Patrick is like, uh, Bray Wyatt is dealing with uh, the 19 or or the flu. (laughs) That's that's like saying uh, back in the day in the Attitude Era, uh, the Undertaker has food poisoning, but the dead man will be back next week in action. He's the dead man. We don't want to think about him with food poisoning. So I understand it doesn't fit the character. But if you're truly going to have Lashley versus Bray at Mania... You have to do something, man. If you don't have Bray, then Uncle Howdy has to do something magnificent. Alexa Bliss, if she wasn't a part of the plans, she has nothing for Mania anyway. I don't know if you guys saw the little Easter egg. Uh, Last week, there was an interview. I forgot who it was with. Maybe Cody Rhodes, even. Um, Or LA Knight, I think it was. LA Knight was about to go over to Rey Mysterio on Friday Night SmackDown. And a lot of people are saying that by the electrical equipment, uh, one of those... um, Boom boxes was a Wyatt logo. And then last night, there was a graphic. Maybe it was for Cody and Roman's match. And underneath, it had little photos of Alexa Bliss and Bray Wyatt. So they're still marketing these two. But if you don't have Bray because something is wrong, then you have to have all hands on deck. And you come up with a fun, creative segment with Lashley and Howdy or Lashley and Alexa. Or some shit has to happen, man. But to do nothing, to not even mention the match, no signs of even Bobby Lashley. And then what? Monday, all of a sudden, we pick up like nothing. The last two weeks, we heard nothing about these individuals. And Monday night, oh, by the way, let's do the muscle man dance again. And they're going to have a match in, in six nights at WrestleMania. It's not going to work. I think at this point, you have to scrap it, which means WrestleMania is not going to have Bray Wyatt. 
Now, some of you may claim, oh, that's great. I don't like him anyway. Well, guess what? I, I love the dude. I think he's fucking magnificent. I think he's one of the best characters of all time. We rock with that dude. It's a pro Bray channel. And it's going to suck for people like BC to not have Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania. And when this dude came back in October, number one merchandise seller overtook Roman Reigns. He's still in the top five, even top four. And he's tussling with the top three in merchandise sales. Still. Top buzz, top metrics, top rated all the time. Whether the match was good or not, or you like it, the Mountain Dew pitch black match, I totally understand. But the lead up to it was the most buzzed and talked about for the Rumble. And if you told me that Bray would not be a part of Mania, I would have said you done falling on your dome piece a couple, two, three, too many times as a kid. But that looks to be the case. It looks to me like we're not going to have Bray Wyatt at Mania. And something absolutely happened. We hope the best for him. We hope he's good. Um, but it looks like we're not going to have a Bray Wyatt match. Do they somehow utilize Bray still? Some people think LA wants to have his moment. LA night. Maybe Bray's going to come out and like, fuck him up. And that's going to be the moment. I see no reason to revisit that. That feud ended at Rumble because it had to. LA Knight had to lose that match against Bray. Because Bray could not lose that. And LA Knight was going to have victory in defeat. The spotlight was on this dude. It's Bray Wyatt, no harm, no foul. I said afterwards, LA Knight has to have a winning streak. Instead, WWE put him in a losing streak. <laughs> He's being beaten two minutes via a backwoods fruit roll-up on Friday night to Xavier Woods. That is not what I expected. There's no reason for Bray Wyatt to come out and just beat him up again. I mean, all through the house shows lately, guys, Bray Wyatt has been taking on LA Knight and beating him. Madison Square Garden was the first show where Bray did not show up. Braun Strowman came in, ended up beating LA Knight too. At this point, everybody and their grandmother beats LA Knight. I don't need to see Bray Wyatt come back just to beat up LA Knight. Other people think Stone Cold Steve Austin is going to give LA Knight his LA moment with a stunner and a beer bash and beer bath. I don't know. LA Knight definitely needs to be a part of it, but uh, if they want to utilize Bray Wyatt, it sucks that he can't be a part of a Mania match, but they can use WrestleMania to kickstart a storyline towards SummerSlam, Saudi Arabia, Backlash, who knows? But they can kickstart, use the platform, and we all get to see at least Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania. But it does not look, and BC will be the first to say, I don't think there should be a match with him and Lashley. There's not enough time. It's silly, and it's going to be so weird if he shows up on Monday, six nights before Mania, with no story being told with him and Lashley, period. End of story. End of discussion. There's no storyline between the two. Them two facing each other from the beginning was weird. And then Monday he just shows up and all of a sudden, we, I mean, you better have the biggest half an hour segment of all time planned if you're going to sell people that we need to see Wyatt and Lashley at WrestleMania. Again, this is a pro Bray channel. I love the dude. I'm never going to uh, speak negatively to Bray Wyatt. Won't won't happen. Guy's a genius in my my eyes. He That's why The Undertaker respects him so much. He really protects the business, and he starts that by protecting his own character, and he really tries to keep kayfabe alive, and for that, he gets tooled on on the social doohickey machines, right? With 140 characters, everybody's a, a, a fucking uh, critic of Bray Wyatt. It's fucking hilarious if they only knew all the metrics and knew that this guy was one of the top dudes in the industry every week, every month, even when he was not with the company. He was topping the charts. But geniuses online uh, think they can critique Bray Wyatt. It's fucking hilarious. But I'll be the first person to say, as a huge backer and supporter of Bray, Bray and Lashley has no business being at WrestleMania because it has been botched from the start. And that is sad to say. Salute to Bray Wyatt. We hope all the best. And I hope to see that dude soon. Alexa Bliss is another one who says, I'm waiting for, for the call. I'm waiting for them to tell me to come back to work. I've been wanting to come back for, to, to work. I, I want to be at WrestleMania. They're sitting me home. They're paying me to sit at home, and I don't want to. I didn't take a hiatus. I want to go back to work. WWE is just... I don't know what the fuck they're doing. There's so many things they could have done with this uh, Bray return. I don't know if... I don't know. And then this latest thing happened with Bray. 
Anyway, that's the subject. That's all I'm going to say, man, because a lot of you guys know that this is a pro-Bray channel. You wanted my thoughts on Bray and Bobby looking like it's scrapped because this is now the second week in a row of no mention of Wyatt and Lashley. Well, that's my thoughts on it. I can officially confirm my thoughts are that it should not be happening at Mania. And that sucks. You know, when I'm saying that, you know it's a pretty bad situation. Um, but it's too close, and they did not do the proper booking for Bray Wyatt or Bobby Lashley. And it's not going to help either one of them to be in the ring together. All right, hour number two, guys. Logan Paul starts hour two live impulsive podcast. Logan rocked a near eight-minute promo by himself, and he nailed it from disrespect from the fans to what to expect at WrestleMania when he knocks out and defeats Seth Rollins. And he really fight for nearly eight minutes, man. He rocked this promo, guys. Talking about how the fans, no matter what he does, they're never going to respect him. Seth says he doesn't belong there, and, he, and they, meaning the whole WWE universe, they don't want him there. And no matter what he does in the ring, what, what he did with Roman, what he's going to do again with Seth Rollins, what he did in the tag match last year at WrestleMania with Miz, it's never going to be enough. They just don't like him. But the fact is, he's just naturally great at this shit. So get used to it. And at WrestleMania, what to expect is Rollins is going to get knocked out again. And whether they like it or not, <laughs> Logan Paul is the real deal. And, and he was really generating... Like, when I say genuine, I mean genuine heel heat. It wasn't just like, I'll oh, get the fuck out of here. You're boring the shit out of us, man. The fans are really into it. And, and you know, that's the type of shit that you really can't. It's like the athleticism, like the wrestling itself, what he did in that ring with Roman Reigns late last year. You really cannot teach that. Either you got this wrestling thing, you have that it factor, or you just don't. Right there's been a lot of people they 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 want to push they try to push and they just are not good. Some of them actually suck, and then there's people that just get it, man. Like a Kurt Angle, a Chad Gable, even a Dominic Mysterio, to be truthful, and a definitely a Logan Paul. Um, and then Rollins shows. Oh, but, but first Logan shows the knockout punch from two weeks ago that he delivered to Seth Rollins, and he showed it like twenty one times, man. Oh. Over and over, even had sound effects, right? He had somebody in the production truck really like playing this up. But then we go up to the Tron. Seth Rollins appears on the Tron. Seth Rollins is actually in the production truck. So Rollins got pissed off. Rollins goes to, to the production truck. And whoever was playing that 21 times, he shut them the fuck up. Rollins is seated next to Kevin Dunn. And Rollins is uh, Rollins says, how can we stop? How can we save this incredibly bad, impulsive show? I have an idea. And Rollins presses the button to his theme music. His music starts to play. As he exits the production truck, man, the camera follows him out. So the camera is behind Rollins as he goes down the steps and he starts dancing in the parking lot as he starts to head toward Gorilla. Again, this was the camera angle, angle earlier when the camera was behind Kevin Owens going into the uh, arena it, it, to ringside through the curtain. And it was the same type of thing where you're behind Rollins. And it was just so cool, man. We don't get that. We don't get to see that type of visual from, from camera B or C usually, right? So it was just, it was cool, man. It, it added a little extra level of suspense, Right, he's going down the steps. He's in the parking lot. It's a different view, right? He's dancing in the fucking park. It's a visual, man. It's such a cool visual. And then he enters the arena, and then we cut to the camera C shot where we're starting. We're gonna pick up Rollins when he comes through the curtain. So the whole thing, what I'm saying is, production wise, the presentation was masterful. Rollins, sure enough, hits the ring, and once Rollins hits the ring, man, he doesn't say a word. First of all, the fans for like a minute, oh, 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 for a whole minute, you could, like Logan played it to where he was legitimately pissed off that they were singing. I mean, he was like, while Rollins' music was playing, Logan Paul is like making fun of him, telling him to shut up. You're all out of tune. This is stupid. 
You're dressed funny, he tells Ryan. I mean, he's talking over the theme music. You never see that. <laughs> I mean, he genuinely looked pissed that they were singing, man. Um, Rollins doesn't say a damn word, and I thought this was brilliant. I, in, in my dome piece, I was literally saying, don't say a word, just get him. Like, it makes sense. This has gotten so heated so quickly that it would make sense that Rollins doesn't even want to spar on the mic. Rollins just wants to drop him, just tackle him. And that's what I was thinking as the music. And then when the music stopped and there was the singing and, and, and then a little bit of silence between the two, I'm like, just tackle him, man. You just drop the mic. You don't need to say a word. And sure enough, drops the mic and he just tackles him. And I'm like, yeah, brother, that's how you do it. Um, Storyline wise, WWE was just on their game last night. Tackles him. The brawl leaks to the outside over the commentary table. Logan's on the commentary table at one point. Rollins goes up to the top rope. He, he's about to deliver a giant splash from the top rope through Logan and the commentary table. But production agents, agent, backstage agents, I think Jamie Noble was one of them. They blocked him. So Rollins ends up cross body splashing two agents. Almost lands on his dome piece. That's how much height he got. Logan was able to use the distraction. Wham! Wabaka! To hit another knockout punch to Rollins. Rollins is out cold. Second time in three weeks. Logan Paul takes a step back. Starts laughing at his handiwork, man. His handiwork. Twice in three weeks. He just starts laughing. He's like, that's how quick, man. All I needed was that one moment. Wabaka! Seth Rollins down and out, bro. Fans are legit heated at Logan Paul. Genuine booze, not piped in. Logan Paul getting that heel heat. Seth Rollins knocked the fuck out. Beautifully done. That is how you, you rock out an action sequence, right? If you're going to tell the story with actual physicality, you have to do it in a believable way. Well, believably, realistically, Rollins would not want to spar verbally with this dude anymore. He'd be done with it. There's great disdain. He made that point from day one. So just tackle the motherfucker. Let's get it on. This is one of those things that you would believe it's just going to go to physical. Cool. Dug it. Simplistic and it works. Seth Rollins, knock the fuck. You just got knocked the fuck out. What's that from? Uh, the movie Friday, right? I think it was, uh, yeah, I think that's Friday, man. Debo, <laughs> was that Zeus? Zeus versus Hulk Hogan was an actual man that this dude was an actor. And Vince McMahon um, uh, had him in No Holds Bar the movie with Hulk Hogan. His name is Zeus. So he was actually an actor first. A big motherfucking dude. Got into wrestling, had some matches with Hulk Hogan, some tag matches. Um, and then he was in this big movie Friday. I think his name was Debo in the movie, right? And he fucking knocks out Ice Cube, I think. Or no, maybe it was somebody else. And then, uh, <laughs> and then who was it? Was it Tucker? I forgot who it was, man. He's like, you just got knocked the fuck out. Anyway, BC's in, in left field with a hockey stick. Let's get back to the fucking show. So that's how we started our number two. Logan Paul knocking out Seth Rollins. A really good 16-minute segment over eight minutes, or basically eight minutes of a promo by... Logan Paul himself. Pretty good shit, man. I'm critiquing the show honestly, as I always do. This was not bad at all. It was actually good. We then go into the first match of the second hour. Dominic Mysterio versus Johnny Gargano. This was an 11-minute match. First half of the match, Mysterio worked the injured ribs of Gargano that was sustained by Grayson Waller last week on NXT television. Waller... Uh, really worked on the ribs of Gargano. Of course, that's going to be a big stand and deliver matchup. The morning of, the day of WrestleMania night one, next Saturday, stand and deliver from NXT, a big pay-per-view premium live event um, from Los Angeles. So um, I like how Johnny Gargano was selling that injury. He had the ribs taped up. And the whole first part of this match, Mysterio really worked on that. On those ribs. We went to commercial. We came back for the second half of the match. Gargano delivered an astounding. Gargano delivered an astounding snake eyes to Dominic. Into the middle turnbuckle, guys. Shit was wild. And Dominic took that move like a damn champ. Now, just picture snake eyes, right? You've seen Undertaker. You've seen Big Daddy Cool. Diesel. Kevin Nash do it so many times. 
You, you, you put your opponent on your shoulder, head that way like he's a lawn dart, and you literally catapult him to the top turnbuckle where their face hits the top turnbuckle. It's snake eyes. But in this instance, Dominic got catapulted into the middle turnbuckle. Now, Johnny Gargano is not the biggest dude, not the tallest dude. Dominic is lengthy. So it was awkward, like just having Dominic on his shoulder. So when he initially catapulted Dominic off of his shoulder, I thought Dominic was going to like land on his head, right? Fucking head first into the canvas. That's how he just catapulted, man. Shows you some strength in Johnny Gargano and how good Dominic is taking the moves because he got catapulted. BC cringed for a second, but he landed right face first into the middle turn. But it was badass, bro. One of the best snake eyes I've ever fucking seen. And it wasn't even onto the top rope. It was the middle turn buckle. Fuck yeah. So anyways, that was a, the, the coolest moment of this match for BC, man. It's the little things for BC, man, when I'm critiquing these uh, and dissecting these matches and shows. Really fucking awesome. Um, And then after that, not too long after that, um, moments later, Mysterio hits a top rope frog splash onto the injured ribs of Gargano for the victory. Dominic wins this match. Johnny Gargano looking up at the lights. It was a clean, for the most part anyway, finish. It was a frog splash. Um, Now, uh, BC would have had this totally different, right? Dexter Loomis and Damian Priest were at ringside the whole match. So BC would have had them kind of tussling during the match, right? And they... They brawl to the back, or maybe they brawl through the crowd, but they disappear into the yonder. Bye bye Dexter Loomis and Damian Priest. This leaves just the two participants in the match, um, Dominic Mysterio and Johnny Gargano. But the referee is like looking over to Loomis and, and Priest, right? They're brawling into the crowd, or the, the referee's on his headset, like trying to get help over to them. So he's distracted a little bit because of Priest and Loomis. This would allow Grayson Waller. I'm just telling you guys how I would book it. This isn't what happened. Dominic beat Johnny Gargano clean with a frog splash. But I would have had Priest and Loomis brawl, cause a little distraction for the referee. Grayson Waller interfere, take out Gargano, and cost him the match. By doing it that way, guys, that would have gave Dominic his big win. I understand you want Dominic to win because he's going to be in a big WrestleMania match with Rey Mysterio, his father. We believe anyway. So you want to make him look good. You want to build him up. You want to have him a big W. That would give Dominic his W and it would put the spotlight onto Gargano and Waller, man. It would be a better spotlight anyway for their stand and deliver match. Right? I mean, show everybody Grayson Waller, man. Because you got a, you got Gargano involved in Grayson Waller and his business in NXT. Bring Grayson Waller over to WWE main roster television. And, and him costing Gargano the match would help Gargano save face and build the story with him and Waller. But they chose not to even do that, man. And Dexter and... Dexter and Damien played no role in this at all, basically. Basically, minor. And Gargano loses clean, and Waller is a no factor. Well, why the fuck do we need to watch Waller and Gargano at Stand and Deliver then? You gotta put all your chips into the fucking basket tonight on, on NXT. But a lot of people are gonna be watching that World Baseball Classic. I don't like excuses, but this is huge. It's Japan and it's the US. Japan won in a walk off last night over Mexico. Japan and U.S. in the World Cup of Baseball? That's massive. Last night was a missed opportunity. BC would have booked Grayson Waller to take out Gargano and cost him the match. Dominic wins, and you build Waller and Gar- Gargano for stand and deliver. And in the, in the middle of it all, Loomis and Priest get to do more than just twiddle their thumbs at ringside. So it was a very weird finish here, man. And it didn't do anything for anybody. Post-match, Dominic cuts a promo on his father setting up a big smackdown. All the family's going to be there. Um, and he's, he's going to really press. He's going to really push the buttons of Rey Mysterio in front of the family. You know, I'm going to get the answer that I want. We're going to have a wrestling match at Mania. So I don't think Rey really gave a fuck. Rey was not in attendance last night. He was probably drinking a nice fucking... Uh, 
uh, Savion Blanc while watching uh, The Last of Us. <laughs> you know, he's probably not listening to his son. Dominic's pissed off at his father having daddy issues. But um, I love the storyline with Dominic and Ray. I was hoping for a little bit more last night with Dominic and Ray Mysterio. I don't like the finish of the match. And Dominic just, I, I mean, it sets up SmackDown pretty good, you know? It's really presenting SmackDown to be must-see, at least for this storyline, because he's saying, in front of family, I'm going to make sure I get the answer that I want from you, Dad. <laughs> um, and then Edge cuts a promo in who knows where. I don't know where the fuck Edge was, man. Um, it's pitch black with big red candles, and Edge does what Edge does best, captivates with just his words. He tells Balor to leave Finn at home and bring the demon to Hell in a Cell. He'd like to meet him. The demon will meet the devil, basically. Edge. Devil Edge. Maybe we're getting brood Edge, but we're definitely getting demon Balor. If you didn't know that at all, if the seeds weren't planted before, last week alone... They're definitely fucking now. The seeds are not just planted. It's growing now, right? That fucking plant is growing now. <laughs> Edge is literally calling out the demon. Now, of course, on one hand, it's going to be so cool to see the demon because the demon is a fucking superstar. On the other hand, it's a it's a catch 22 for BC. I look at it on, on another bittersweet aspect. For years, people like BC have been clamoring to see the demon. And now that Balor has finally established the Finn Balor character, looks comfortable, he looks to be fully confident, he looks to be rocking this Judgment Day Finn Balor character. And now they're going to bring back the demon when it's literally not needed? And it's so weird because the demon is a face character. We love the fucking demon. It's going to be so weird to boo a demon, Balor. And he's coming to Hell in a Cell just because it's Hell in a Cell. And it fits, basically. It doesn't, though, because it's against Face Edge. And Demon Balor doesn't even work with the Judgment Day Finn Balor. So I understand we, we love the concept because we get to see the demon, right? BC, I hear you, but it's the demon. Let's just, let's just enjoy this. Well, we are. You know, it's going to be good to see the demon should be interesting. Hopefully, it's really fun. I get it. It's weird, though, that for years we've been pleading to get the demon. And Finn refused because he didn't want to lean on the demon crutch. He didn't want us to even think about the demon. He wanted to show everybody that Finn Balor alone can get over. And when he finally starts to get over with Judgment Day, now we're seeing the fucking demon as a heel, by the way. It's weird, man. That's all. I hope you guys understand. Of course, we're, we're, it'll be nice to see him. It's intriguing. It's just weird, man. Where the fuck was this energy years ago? We've should, we should have seen the demon at least once or twice a year, guys. Especially when he was a face. It's bullshit. You guys know that, man. And it's going to take the thunder away from Edge because nobody's going to want to boo Demon Balor, bro. It's weird. It's like Rhea Ripley, right? Like, uh, she's supposed to be the heel going against Charlotte. They're, they're portraying Charlotte as the big face at WrestleMania. Rhea Ripley's the big heel. And last night, they booked Rhea Ripley like a face, right? I mean, that ended our number two, actually, guys. Rhea Ripley was in the middle of the ring, and we went through five minutes about Charlotte's insecurities. When when Rhea Ripley's career is said and done, and the highlight reel plays for her at the Hall of Fame, <laughs> this is not going to be one on the highlight reel, right? This is not one of those. Uh, this is not one of those promos that landed for BC. It was too drawn out, and there was not enough substance in it to really care. There was no zingers. There's nothing in this promo you're gonna remember. And when it was all said and done, she ends it with, uh, she says, and I quote. You don't have to respect me, but you will fear me. And, and that's a quote we've heard from a million wrestlers a million separate times. <laughs> um, damage control then hit the ring. Bailey has words with Rhea Ripley. I'm going to say that again. Damage control hits the ring. And Bailey has words with Rhea Ripley and vice versa. And... We then have a impromptu, an impromptu matchup to end our number one between Bailey and Rhea Ripley. What the? F what? 
Bailey versus Rhea Ripley, guys. First, they're verbally like going at one another. Then it's so heated, we have to have a match. This is a. This makes zero sense for a million reasons. At the top of the list is the fact that it's a heel and a heel. What? What? <laughs> this makes. Who the fuck would book this? You had no other faces that could come out. It, and, and guys, because this match was happening, because you did nothing creatively with Bailey and Damage Control, you could not sell the six-woman tag at Mania. And they actually had Trish Stratus and Lita in the building. So Becky Lynch, Lita, and Trish Stratus had to come to the ring with a giant bag of popcorn and... And they were used just to watch the match. During the match, they they tussled a little bit with um with EO and Dakota and maybe even Bailey. Uh, so they tussled a little bit. For the most part, though, they they took some selfies, they ate a big bag of popcorn. That's how you utilize Trish Stratus and Lita and Becky Lynch. That's the best way you use them. Coming out and watching an impromptu match with heel versus heel, Bailey, 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 Bailey and Bailey, the new tag team, Bailey and Rhea Ripley. That's really what we're going to fucking do, man. Are you serious? Guys, I'm praising most of this show because I thought it was that that good. The storytelling last night was another level uh, better than what it usually is. Two to three times on a lot of it, like the bloodline. But this is one of those segments I refuse. I couldn't even. I couldn't even if I wanted the bullshit. I couldn't. This was pathetic. Trish and Lita, by the way, look like they're 25 years old tops. They look better today than possibly they did 20 years ago. (laughs) They look so good, man. They are so fucking beautiful. Um, And just the shape that they're in. Damn. Um... But to utilize them like that, I mean, that's just pathetic, man. And, and then um, Rhea just hits the riptide, and Bailey is defeated flat on her back, one, two, three, looking up at the lights. Again, I ask, what? Why did Bailey have to job out like that, man? She has a WrestleMania six woman tag match. Damage control needs to, desperately needs to be looked at as a real, legit, badass faction. Not just a joke. And that was the type of booking that digs their hole deeper into Jokeville. How are people supposed to really take them seriously when they lose? They come, they came out to talk shit and then barely moments later gets fucking riptide and looks up at the lights. Could you make damage control look like schmucks? Any more than they have over the re- since their inception. Even with tag titles. You're talking about one of the best women's wrestlers in the world. Io Sky. Io Shirai. A badass female wrestler like Dakota Kai. And one of the best to do it like Bailey. You put them together. They should be taking over the women's division. Literally. Their mission statement should be living out in real time. Instead they're nothing but. It's nothing but a joke after a joke after a joke segment. Last night was pathetic. It did not make Rhea Ripley look good at all. Do not give her a mic for five fucking minutes next time. Unless it's going to be something of substance. And she's going to deliver a passionate promo that's going to rock us to the core. On top of that, don't have another heel come down. Because you have nothing creatively for anybody else. Don't give us a heel versus heel match for no fucking reason. That's going to make one of them look like an idiot. And if you're going to have a six woman tag at Mania... Make sure that you give a fuck about it creatively and booking-wise before you give us the match at Mania. Nothing at the end of our number two. Nothing was done properly. It was all done negligently and erratically. Because it was erratic. And when when you're like that so badly, it's negligent. Absolutely negligent. That's the word I would use. That type of booking is negligent. Hour number three. Salute unit. Hour number three is Ricochet defeating Chad Gable to start us off. This was a fun match. Gable should have won this match. I will say that in every Gable match probably. 
Gable just loses so much. And then once in a while l- lately, right, he'll like win a match out of nowhere. You think maybe they're starting to like give him a little bit of the rocket and then boop, right back to Loserville. Um, but, but this was at least a good match. Man, Maxine hits ringside, takes Otis away. This sets up the distraction for Gable. And Rico hits a shooting star for the W. Nothing more to really say here. They're really pumping up this Otis Maxine story. I kind of like where it's going. It would make a lot more sense if there was tag titles on the line. And then Maxine has a reason to divide them. She's trying to get Masse and Mansoir tag titles. Right now, I don't really know what the big purpose to divide them would be. So maybe we should have sat on this a little bit and see if tag titles would ever enter the frame in the next six months, but they're going to pull it now. And I, I like the little inter- I always like Otis, man, especially when they put him with the ladies. Like him and Mandy Rose was such a fun story. Dolph Ziggler and Sonya Deville were involved in it. It was a couple years ago on SmackDown. And Mandy Rose had this thing with Otis. I just love that. And I I don't mind Maxine and Otis at all. Or Otis. Interested to see where that goes. Next up, Asuka and Bianca Belair versus Chelsea Green and Piper Niven. Uh, They announced earlier that Carmella was going to be unable to compete. Chelsea Green walked up backstage to Adam Pearce. Excuse me. I'm looking for the manager. Adam Pearce is like for the thousandth time. Chelsea, I told you it's me. And she's like, well, I need someone who makes matches because obviously Carmella isn't here and we had cute matching outfits and like she can't compete. So like I want somebody who I know I can depend on. I want to make a match and it's going to be this woman and Piper Niven walks in the frame. And Adam Pierce is like, how many times do I have to, I make the matches. It's me. (laughs) I just love how Chelsea Green refuses to believe that that is the manager and she keeps asking who the fucking manager is. I love it. It's hilarious to me. So it's no, it's not uh, Carmella. We hope she's good, by the way. All the best to Carmella. Not sure why she missed uh, the night. But Asuka and Bianca, can they coexist? I cannot stand this storyline. I told you guys, we did a live stream uh, late last night, right before Raw. We went live. And BC said that, that this has to end one way. Asuka has to beat down uh, Bianca Belair. That's the only way that this segment can be saved. They cannot just coexist going into WrestleMania. Asuka has to show the world she's the heel going in. There's a reason that she has turned into the Kana personality, and it's because she's done. She's sick and tired. She is through with being booked like a chump and waiting for her turn. She's now taking it. This had to be last night, the definitive moment and statement laid down by Kana Asuka. And I told you guys in yesterday's stream, that's the only way I'm going to buy into this. And I love this matchup. Uh, I love the booking of Kana Asuka since she turned back into Kana's personality, persona. But guys, there was no way that there was no way that this match could end without Belair flat on her back looking up at the lights by Asuka, her own partner. And sure enough, when it was all said and done, we would get that, man. The match itself was under eight minutes from bell to bell, just under eight minutes from bell to bell. Belair pins Piper via an earth cascading KOD, guys. Bruh, I'm talking Niven just balanced for five complete seconds. On the shoulders of Bianca Belair. Please picture that. Piper Niven was on the shoulders of Belair for many seconds. And at that point, all Bianca has to do now, all like it's easy. She now has to rotate Niven 180 degrees and face plant her face first into the canvas to finish off the KOD. So... That means that one false move in Niven is going to land on her dome piece. Uh, it's, it's sheer strength at that point, guys. Belair has her on her shoulders. There's a lot of responsibility on Belair's shoulders, literally, man. No, like, it's not just Niven on her shoulders. There's a lot of responsibility on her shoulders. She is now responsible for not injuring her. That's a lot of strength to pancake her 180 degrees face first into the canvas to finish off the KOD. And guys, out of the fucking park, man. Belair absolutely crushes the KOD. Delivers that earth cascading, 
absolutely thunderous KOD. That KOD was so badass that it catapulted everybody's ass out of their seats in attendance, guys. You could hear that fucking pop from that KOD. BC would have booked Asuka turning on Belair mid-match. I think it would have made even more sense. The victory means, this victory means nothing to me. I'm going to flatline you here and show you we're not going to coexist and show you that I mean business going to WrestleMania. That's how BC would have had the turn. But Belair is able to get the pin over Niven off of the KOD, so the match is complete. But post-match, man, we got what needed to happen. Asuka takes out Belair, flattens her where she stood, drops her like a ton of bricks, then delivers a couple of kicks to the dome piece to rock Bianca Belair. And the segment ends with her statement delivered. Loved it. This is exactly what needed to happen. I was actually yelling at the big screen. I said, more? Lay it on. I would have laid into fucking Bianca. I would have had Asuka deliver some fucking... I mean, literally, show a side of Kana Asuka that the states, anyway, have never seen. The side of the murder clown that they have never seen. This Kana Asuka. I was saying, drop her again. Give her another knee to the dome piece. Give her a kick. Fucking start give, start pelting her. Lefts, right, jabs, upper, start rocking her. They didn't do that. They just ended it with a couple more kicks after she was originally dropped. But I was saying, fuck yeah, man, lay into it. And Asuka gets up, and now you hear a little bit more booze. People are like, what the fuck? That was not necessary. You won the match with her. Yeah, it is necessary. Asuka proved a statement. And this is the type of story that should be told. We're not here to coexist going to Mania. We're not going to coexist next Monday night. Now you know it's, it's legit. This match is legit. I'm coming in there not to be your side chick. Like I was your side chick for six months while we battled damage control. You're the champion and we're like a couple of Christmas ornaments hanging on a Christmas tree. I'm done being the side chick is what Kana Asuka is telling in that statement to Bianca last night. That's what needed to be told and it was told beautifully. Salute to Kana Asuka. It's going to be an awesome match. And this is going to be Asuka's big moment. She has never won a WrestleMania match in the nine years she's been with WWE. The over six that she's been with the main roster. This is going to be her first WrestleMania victory. And it's going to be the biggest fucking way, man. Hoisting up that title. Bianca, no harm, no foul. She's going to have victory and defeat. Um, she's going to be fine after this, guys. But you cannot create Kana Asuka, this new personality which is her old personality from Japan, you cannot book her so strongly. All of this was just to lose at WrestleMania. She never even got the culminating moment. She never reached the pinnacle on the main roster. What? Seems odd to me. I, it, that's not. Nah, no, nah, you have to have the culminating story, man. Culminate the story. Um, and then we go into the main event segment, which was reserved for Roman Reigns, Paul Heyman, and Solo Sokoa of the Bloodline, all middle of the ring. There is nothing like a Roman Reigns entrance, guys. That, that theme music hits, you feel a certain way. Paul Heyman treating Roman, looking at Roman like he is an actual god. The entire crowd throwing up those ones. It's just an electric atmosphere when Roman Reigns is in the building. And, and, and I guess that's what they're going for, right? Limited dates, missing shows, not always on TV, makes them more special. We know that's a winning formula. We saw it with Hulk Hogan back in the day all the time. Hogan was never on the shows. BC just says we need to see a little bit more of Roman because he's got two titles right now. They unified them and... And he's the part of the biggest storylines. And there's some shows that I feel he does have to be a part of that he's not. But I totally understand not being on all of them. Because look at the reception, the reaction. It's a special feeling when Roman is in the building. And you don't got to take my words for it. Just look. Again, last night. Look at it, man. Listen to that reaction. Watch the ones go up. This guy's a heel, the biggest heel in the company. One of the biggest, if not the biggest heel in all of pro wrestling. And the reaction is intense. So cool to see, man. Um, after we get a St. Louis acknowledge me, Cody Rhodes' theme music 
instantly hits. Oh! Cody Rhodes immediately hits the ring, does not allow Roman Reigns to say or utter another word. And for the next 10 minutes, we are in a war a war of words. Um, some awesome, and I hate the word awesome in pro wrestling because it's overused, like the word buried, um, banger, and so many others. But this was some awesome storytelling. Rhodes asks Roman to clarify what he meant recently by saying he has a Cody problem. What did you mean by that? What do you mean you have a Cody problem? Roman says, and I quote, you are not the problem. It's not you. No, no, no. You're not the problem. It's what you represent that's the problem. You're like our fathers. You're a pro wrestler. You see, I'm a fighter and I fight for top prizes and that's what makes me as good as I am. I fight when I need to. I fight on the grandest stage. You're just a pro wrestler wrestler you keep talking about having a big moment on april 2nd no your big moment will be the day after on april 3rd when you look in the mirror and you realize you're a loser and you're just gonna run away because that's all you ever do is you run away you ran away from this company because of stardust you ran away, you started another company, and you couldn't get over in that company, so you ran away. Of course, talking about all elite wrestling. So he couldn't get over, so you ran away again. And on April 3rd, when you look in the mirror and realize you didn't get the job done, you're going to run away again because it's what you do best. Damn, Roman Reigns saying this motherfucker ran away from AEW and shit. Saying that all he does is run away. And, and Cody responded saying, no, if you followed my journey, uh, you know that that's, that's what I did. I, I was always searching. I was always searching to be that desired. I was always searching for my path, to be on the right path, to totally be fulfilled. Am I where I should be and need to be? Where is my necessity, basically? I love how Cody said there's not a lot of lies there, actually. And Cody says, you know, April 3rd will be that that defining day, but it won't be for me. April 3rd, the day after Mania, is when you, Roman, are going to look in the mirror. And you're going to realize you just lost it all. You lost your titles. You don't have them anymore. And when that happens, down goes the empire. Jay... Jay is going to leave you. And that's when it really got real for Roman. The look in his face. He was like, he like it really became a real possibility that Jay could one day leave him. And that just rocked. That was a special type of hit for Roman. And he really like became awake at that point. Jay's going to leave you. And then Cody says, Jimmy's going to leave you. And then Solo. And then he says, and you've been grilling me all night, by the way. There's an old saying I was told, he says, something like, you're not ready. And kid, you're not ready. <laughs> so watch how you're grilling me. But he goes back to Robin and he says, Solo will leave you. And then he says, and Paul, he'll just become an advocate again. Almost alluding to a lot of things. Like he'll either leave you or he won't be as needed. Maybe he'll be back with somebody like Brock Lesnar. He'll just be an advocate again. I was hoping he was going to say, and Paul, he's going to stop kissing your ass and he'll be gone. Snap of a finger, blink of an eye. But instead, he said he'll just become an advocate again. And that still got a big pop from the crowd. Ooh. Um, so, damn, he once he started saying that the entire one by one, the bloodline is going to leave you. And man, he ended it by saying, I forgot the exact quote, but he's, he was like the, a chief without his tribe, um, a fucking, uh, a Roman without his reigns, meaning his title reigns. I was so special. That's what he said. He said, you're going to be left as a Roman without his reigns, a chief without his tribe and a couple of other things. It was just beautiful. It was brilliant, man. The way he ended this promo, dude. And I'm like, guys, just go another 20 minutes. We don't got to stop. And then I looked at the time. I'm like, ah, oh, we're almost about to end the show. There, there is a time limit. 
I wanted another 20 minutes. That's how into this I was, man. If you were not sold with Roman and Cody, you were sold last night. Or, or you're just literally just hating on the product, man. If you did not love that fucking promo, uh, I, then d- WWE for sure is just not your cup of coffee, right? M- maybe go over to All Elite Wrestling, go go catch some bangers and some clangers, some five-star, six-star classics. Um... Because this is just not, I mean, this is pro wrestling in a nutshell. This is some of the best storytelling. We thought it was just Sammy and Bloodline. No, what we just learned last night is now it's Cody and Bloodline as well. Cody and Roman are now carrying that flag straight into the main event, April 2nd of WrestleMania. Damn! And we ended the night with Solo. Um, he, he tried to go after Cody. Cody actually gave him like a super kick or some shit. Then Solo got pissed off. Solo was about to charge, but Roman jumped up on the apron and stopped him. He said next week, probably do a one-on-one match, I guess, Cody and Solo. But you you see him mouth the words uh, next week to Solo. Wait, on my command, he says. And Solo's looking at Roman like he's his dad, you know, like, sorry, dad. (laughs) And Cody's ready. Cody did not run away, dude. Cody's like, if both of you get in the ring, one of you's, I'm ready right now, man. And we fade to black. We go off the air. I just thought it was beautiful. I didn't even need the extra solo Sokoa physicality with Cody. I mean, that promo alone. Wow. I said in yesterday's live stream right before Raw, I said, I want to see another layer to the story. Uh, Not just a promo. But if you do the simplistic promo... Don't make it simplistic. Let's add something so suspenseful, man. Let's add. Let's have one of those promos that gets us talking the next day, the next week, and we're not going to forget about it the next month. And we got it, man. We got it last night. We got one of those awesome, awesome, you're sold type of promos. You know, instantly, a promo like that instantly sells you on the match. Instantly sells you on WrestleMania's main event if you weren't already. That's what I got for you guys. That was Monday Night Raw 3, 2023, the first day of spring yesterday, different time zones for a lot of people, but by now, wherever you are in the world, it should be the first day of spring, I would think, so kick it off the right way, man. WWE did. This was a damn good Raw. Could it have been better? No question. They're still far away from being what they used to be. But it definitely was not bad, man. Storylines took precedent. Our number one was filled with the Bloodline storyline. Bloodline and Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn. Bloodline internal feud. By the end of the night, Cody Rhodes and the Bloodlines feud. Um, Dominic is setting up the next chapter of him and Ray's feud for SmackDown. I wish we got more on Raw. Kana Asuka finally kicks this feud into high gear, man. Turning on Bel Air. No more coexisting. We don't got to see him in a tag team next week, guys. No more co- coexisting. Bel Air's now pissed off. Asuka has proven her fucking statement, mission statement. So that storyline can now, with another fucking week of Raw left in SmackDown, we can fucking take that to another level, hopefully, next week. Leading into Mania. Um, so much, so much good stuff, man. There's optimism in the air. I fucking love it, man. This is what, last week on Raw, last week on SmackDown, I feel like we phoned it in. Last night, got creative, man. Logan Paul knocking Seth Rollins out twice in two and three weeks. Seth Rollins is going to be pissed, bro. Logan Paul is making this dude look like a fool, and Rollins knows it. It's not the outfits. It's not the character that he's playing. No, who's making him look like a clown is Logan Paul. And this tells us that Rollins will definitely be collecting that W at Mania, we believe. Logan Paul, there'll be no harm, no foul. Logan can lose this and lose against Reigns like he did, and he can use that in his promos. He could say, yeah, I, I lost, but look look at the matches that I had. I came within a moment of beating Roman Reigns and Rollins. And this is just the first few matches of my career. You've got really good wrestlers like Chad Gable on losing streaks. Ali and Dolph Ziggler couldn't pay you a million dollars for a victory right now. And I'm taking on top-level talent and almost beating them, so Logan Paul is going to be fine. But I love what I saw with him and Rollins last night. There was just so much good. What a Monday Night Raw, man. They really turned it around from seven nights ago. We wish Bray Wyatt the very best. He should be one of the best storylines right now heading into Mania. And he's a non-factor. I I cannot understand that. Um, But we'll see. So, that's it, man. About an hour and a half. A little more. What, What a fucking review, man, huh? 
Uh, amp unit, red team, go whoop today's ass. Gold team, keep those gold cards activated at all times. Gold team has to stay amplified. That's what it means to be next level subs on this channel. Those gold cards hold a lot of weight and value. So you guys have to stay amplified. Uh, but whoop that ass. Any breaking news comes up, uh, even if it's audio format only, wherever I am in the world, it will be broken to you guys, man. It's WrestleMania season. We are now 11 nights away from Mania. So BC is going to be on top of all of the top news in the wrestling world, I assure you. Um, so that's that. Think, be, live, amped always. You guys know the deal. Top guy, I'm out. We the ones, they all the twos, they damn well know it. So the top guy right now is going to say, check you later. BC, I'm out.